we are very happy to invite Professor Wang to give us a, a talk. Wan Yang Wang is an assistant professor at Rogers. He did his PhD at Stanford Mass, working with Professor Percy Diakonis. His research interests include Monte Carlo method, especially Markov chain Monte Carlo probability and Bayesian statistics. So let's welcome him. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for the very kind introduction. And it's my great pleasure to present our very recent work here at Honghai Quantum Computing Research Center. So I myself is not an expert at all in quantum computing. So mainly I do either Markov chain or Monte Carlo or Markov chain Monte Carlo. But recently I've started to learn quantum computing since I feel it's a exciting and emerging field. And it's also quite beautiful. So it's great chance for me to discuss with many experts here. So today's talk, I will talk about our recent work on repeated averages on graphs. And this is joint work with my collaborators, Mario and Ramis. So they both do a lot of work in quantum. But this problem we're talking about is essentially a classical stochastic process. And we're studying its like a convergence properties. But we do have some motivation in quantum computing, as we will see in a few minutes. So feel free to interrupt me if there's anything I'm not clear. So let's get started. Basically, today's agenda is I will start with the problem setup because it's a simple and essentially quite a natural process. And then I will talk about some history, stories, and motivation on why people studying this kind of process and why it's uh, somehow related to quantum. And then we will present our result. And in the end, I will go through the proof for our main result, which is basically a universal lower bound for this kind, this type of stochastic process. Okay, so the problem setup is very simple. Assuming you have a graph, and the graph is assumed to be simple, undirected, and a connected graph, it has n nodes. So you associate each number with each node. Therefore, it's convenient to sort of encode the numbers by a uh, n-dimensional vector. And once you have that vector, you will call that vector your initialization. So each coordinate corresponds to one node. And then we can do a stochastic process. The process is at each step, we choose a random edge from the graph uniformly at random. So um, after we choose the edge, we are doing average. That's why we call it a repeated average or averaging process. We will average the two nodes connected by the random edge that we choose. So for example, if we choose the edge ij, then we will update our current rate, uh, sorry, our current v by averaging the i's and the j's entry. So the updated vector will be the same as v at every coordinate except for the i's and j's coordinate. In the i's and the j's, it will be the average of vi plus vj. Okay, so this gives one step of our procedure. It's simple. We choose a random edge and do the average. And if we do this step by step, so on and so forth, it gives rise to a stochastic process. So you start with the initialization, and then you do this repeated averages. So you have a random vector v1, which is close to v0. And after another step, you have a even more random v2, and you do that so on and so forth, it will give you a stochastic process. So a quick remark is this, because we choose a random edge and the edge depends on the underlying graph structure G. So in the maybe the simplest or the more, most natural case where G equals KN, KN here stands for the complete graph. So every node is connected to all other nodes. Then basically this process is equivalent to at every time we uniformly at random picks two different indices and average these two indices. In fact, the case where G equals KN is a 
very important base case for our analysis, though it have already been analyzed before. So are you in 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 this graph? Are you just a randomly pick an edge and find yes. uh, update update the the connected node yes. with yeah. uh, their average value? And every time you randomly do this again, and eventually, I think everyone will become the same, right? Yeah, exactly. So you've already said what I'm going to say in the in in the next slide. So <laughs> yeah, but but you are totally right that eventually it will converge to the sort of average vector, which oh, is okay. like yeah. But oh, and okay. and by the way, it seems I'm not able to see the face of the audience when I do the full screen oh. share. So uh, so. W would it be okay? So if I now I exit the full screen share and w will, will that sort of infect your in infect you when you are viewing my screen? Can you still see the the the, the screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm 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 okay. Oh, okay. So uh, can I probably just do it this way because then I will be able to <laughs> look. At the, the I, I will be able to see like uh, how many people there are, which maybe have a little mm -hmm. bit more interaction. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Well, thanks. That's that's that that's a great question. So so basically, we have this kind of stochastic process, and in fact, uh, sometimes we make fun of this process. We say this is some kind of wealth distribution process. Like uh, we have some very hypothetical process. You can imagine the initialization is the wealth of different people, and when two people meet with each other, the wealth just uh, get averaged. I don't know why whether it will really happen in real life, but if it's actually the case, then I hope I will meet. Uh, Bill Gates at some day, then I will be super wealthy. <laughs> yeah, but anyways, so this is the setup of the process, and then we look at a very simple example, which we take G to be the triangle, so that's the uh, three nodes complete graph. So assuming we start at step zero, which and the initialization is you have a one at the bottom left and a zero elsewhere. So at each step, I will use red color to denote the edge I pick. So suppose as the first step, I pick the bottom edge. Then after the average, this one, this one will be averaged with a zero. So we will have 0 0.5, 0 0.5. And in the next step, we pick another edge uniformly at random. But maybe there is a chance that we still pick the bottom edge. Then basically, it doesn't. The vector doesn't change at all because it's already the two nodes already have the same value. And in the third step, suppose we pick the right edge. Then 0.5 will average with zero, so we have two zero point two five, and then our vector will be 0 0.5, 0 0.25, 0 0.25. And in the fourth step, assuming we pick the left edge, then we will have 0.375, to because that's the average of 0 0.5 and 0 0.25. And finally, in the fifth step, maybe we pick the right edge, then we will have 0 0.3125. So I don't want to do it for for the steps, but even after five steps in this sort of hypothetical realization of the process, you will see at the very beginning, the distribution is very imbalanced. You have a one at one point and a zero elsewhere. But after five steps, all the three nodes have approximately the same value. They have 0 0.3 something. And uh, I guess you can imagine after many, many steps, the value of each node will be approximately one third. OK, so let's make it a little bit formally. So we can define V bar to be the average of the element wise summation of our initial vector. So V bar is the summation of V zero over N. Then basically we have two very quick observation. So the first observation is, first of all, the coordinate sum will not change over time. So even though the process is stochastic, it has randomness there, but the coordinate-wise summation is an invariant because when we are doing the average, we're not changing the sum at all, no matter which edge we pick and uh, like uh, what kind of randomness we have, the summation will always be fixed. There won't be any randomness there on the summation. 
So also, since the sum will be fixed, so the average will also be fixed, which won't change over time. And the second observation is our vector vt will actually converge to the average vector. Average vector is the n-dimensional vector where each coordinate equals v bar. It will eventually converge to this vector as t goes to infinity. So um, this is not super straightforward, but it's also not too hard to prove. If eventually, like uh, as long as we assume the underlying graph G is connected, then this result holds. But all I have said is more qualitative description on the process. We we'll, we say the process will converge, but of course we want to know how fast the convergence happens. So that's our main question. What can we say about the speed of convergence? But this sentence, this red question mark, this sentence is not very well defined mathematically because when we are really talking about convergence, we need to pre-specify many parameters and it depends on many parameters. For example, it depends on at least these parameters. The problem of course depends on the graph G, as you can imagine different graph may have different behavior on the convergence. And it depends on your initialization V0. For example, in the extreme case, if we start the process at like a one over n, one over n, one over n, this kind of vector, every point takes the same value, then after averaging, it won't change at all. So the initialization matters a lot. Lastly, it depends on the metric that we measure convergence. So there are many different metrics like L1, L2, or in general, LP metric or there are different kinds of divergence, like KL divergence or some other things. So it depends on at least these three parameters. And we will specify this when we are getting into the technical part. But this is the setup of the process. So then I will talk a little bit on the motivation on why people study in this kind of process. First of all, it's an interesting process. It's simple and it's sort of natural process. And in fact, this process, this averaging process, is one example of a larger class of process, which is called, which we call the local linear update process or LLU process. So basically, LLU process means we are doing the update, but at each step, we only update very locally on the current state, and the updating rule will be linear. So this is exactly what happened in our averaging process, because at every step, we only average two coordinates, so it's very local. And we are doing the average, which is a linear transformation. But of course, this is only one example, because the state space are the vectors, and the linear transformation is the average. And of course, we can consider all kinds of other examples. For example, we can replace the average by like a swapping, which is another linear process, and we can replace the vector space to some matrix space, so which conclude, oh, sorry, which includes some examples that I'm going to talk about. So this LLU process includes many in important examples. So besides the averaging process, there is a very important example in probability theory, which is called a random transposition model. So this model is, best illustrated by shuffling cards. Assuming you have n cards in a deck and you are shuffling them in the following way. At each step, you pick out two cards uniformly at random. So you uniformly at random choose two cards and you swap the position of these two cards. So that's what we call random transposition. So after many, many steps of shuffling, this random deck distribution will be close to the uniform distribution on all the possible uh, permutations. Therefore, this is essentially a random walk on the permutation group, and the people want to study its convergence property for this simple model. And it, it turns out that in the 1980s, Diakonis and Shashahani, they have proved that, they have proved this kind of random transposition model have a sharp cutoff phenomenon Basically, they have shown the exact like a magnitude and even the constant for the convergence of this random transposition model. And 
Their paper used the technique of group representation theory, and it has been very influential, not only because people have understanding of this simple random transposition model, but also because this model can be used as lots of base case and used for comparison for more sophisticated models. So when people are analyzing a sophisticated model, one natural way is to do some comparison using some comparison inequalities to compare their model with the simple model. Because of the simplicity, we know everything about the random transposition model, so that can be translated back to non-trivial results on more sophisticated model. That's why analyzing this kind of simple model are very useful for doing theoretical analysis. And that's also part of our motivation on studying the specific averaging process, this, which is another type of simple and natural stochastic process. And besides the transposition model, there are other LLU process, which are get, we will get closer and closer to quantum. But to start with, we will talk about Cax walk. So Cax walk is another very simple LLU process. So first we talk the Cax walk on the sphere. So this is a stochastic process. Our initialization will be a vector of length n, which has a unit L2 norm. In other words, the initialization is on the unit sphere, S n minus 1. And at each step, the process picks a pair of indices, i, j, uniformly at random, so which is similar to our process. But what they are doing is, after they pick the pair, they also choose a uniformly distributed angle and rotate the v, i, v, j coordinate by angle theta. So after the rotation, the updated vector will still be on the unit sphere because it doesn't change the magnitude. And this process also has pretty long history. It's introduced by the great probabilist Mark Keck in 1954 as a model for statistical physics. And then it's found lots of applications in stats, econ, and computer science, but because of time, I won't go into the applications. But again, even analyzing this simple model to get the sharp or correct convergence speed involves quite sophisticated techniques. For example, the Yang Resi, she published a paper in the Annals of Probability to calculate the correct magnitude of spectral gap. And Carlin, Carvado, and Loss published paper in ACTA to exactly calculate out the spectral gap of this process. And then Pillai and Smith in 2017, they calculate the convergence upper bound for the total variation distance. So that's the Cox work on the sphere, and it can be generalized in many ways. For example, you can replace the geometry. Here you have sphere, but you can replace it to by other natural geometries, such as simplex. And another important generalization is the Cox work on matrix space. So previously, we we're doing the random walk on vectors, on vectors which has unit L2 norm. But another natural generalization is random walk on the matrix space. So we start with the initialization, which belongs to the special orthogonal group, which are the group of orthogonal matrix, which has the determinant one. And at each step, you pick a pair uniformly at random and pick a uniformly distributed angle. Now, Instead of updating the vector, you are multiplying your current matrix by a rotation matrix or by a unitary matrix. The unitary matrix is defined as a rotation in the IJ plane. So after multiplying this rotation matrix, you get a new group matrix in the special orthogonal group. And after many steps, the stationary distribution would be the hard measure on the SON group. So again, people want to analyze the convergence rate or the spectral gap or all other properties. But in fact, as far as I know, even for this model, there are still lots of open problems on the actual convergence speed under different notions. So this model is introduced in Hastings' seminal paper at Biometrica, which is a top stats journal in the 1970s. So if you are familiar with Monte Carlo, you might know that uh, the Metropolis Hastings algorithm is the uh, maybe most popular variant of MCMC methods. And it's called Metropolis Hastings. And the Hastings 
name just comes from this paper because he introduced Markov chain Monte Carlo methods to statisticians in his 1970 paper. And in his like a main example, he used this Cax work on the special orthogonal group. But still, even after 50 years, now we are in 2022, still the convergence property for this model hasn't haven't been completely solved. So there are interesting open problems there. And if we go a little further, we can see another LLU process, which is Google's quantum supremacy circuit. So basically, their experiments is they have n qubits and they place the n qubits in a two dimensional lattice. So basically, it's a lattice of size square root of n times square root of n. And then what they are doing is they are doing the like a unitary transformation. So they are applying independent random gates on neighbor qubits. So according to their paper, they showed the structure at the uh, top uh, top right figure. That's how they do the like a random unitary transformation. So they do local transformation on neighbor qubits in this lattice. That's how they design their circuits. And if they apply the circuits again and again, again, the stationary distribution would be the hard measure or the uniform distribution on the unitary matrix of size q to the power of n. So it's a huge matrix. And when the input are all zeros, the output probability for every n uh, base of length n will converge to the Porter Thomas distribution. And I think according to what I read, that's how Google like claims its quantum supremacy. But essentially in their in, in, in their experiment, they do this kind of LLU process on the lattice neighboring qubits. So if we look at this circuit or this kind of unitary transformation with the CAX work, we will find that they are very similar in terms of they are both local linear updates, but they have subtle difference. Their difference is in CAX work, we're picking a pair ij uniformly at random, which means no matter how far this pair is, no matter it's one, two, or it's one, one hundred, each pair have the same probability of being picked. However, in Google's supremacy circuit, they only pick two neighbor qubits on the lattice, which means in Google's experiment or in the actual experiment, there is an underlying graph structure on this experiment. So there is still a graph structure on the CAX work if we view the underlying graph structure as the complete graph. But in practice, people don't usually use complete graph. For example, Google uses lattice graph, and maybe there are all different kinds of graph. So that explains another part of motivation that we want to study the averaging process on graphs instead of on like a complete graph. We want to study the averaging process on general graph. So going back to our business, the uh, averaging process is also have been studied before, not that much, but it has been studied. So around uh, 1980s, uh, Jane Bergen, who is a great mathematician, asked Percy about the convergence of the averaging process on the complete graph. Basically, we pick two indices uniformly at random and do the averaging. And then I think Ramis asked Percy the similar or the same problem, and this inspires the following work by Chatterjee, Diakonis, Sly, and Zhang, which is recently published in the Annals of Probability. So they study this process on the complete graph, and they establish a sharp cutoff at the time n log n over q log 2. So I will explain the notions such as the cutoff in a few more slides later. But basically, they exactly solve the problem, and they get a very sharp results. They know everything about the convergence of the averaging process on complete graph. And there is also a survey ad article by Elders and Lenoin, I, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce the name, in probability service in 2012, which has some nice results and some applications of this kind of averaging process. But overall speaking, this process, especially the process on general graph, haven't been studied that much before the 
Percy's work. But after this work, it has been studied quite a lot. Okay, so I think that's enough like uh, stories and the motivations. I will stop here a little bit and see if there's any question on the setup and the motivation. If there's no question, I will move on to the technical part. Uh, sorry, a quick question. Uh -huh. So your purpose is to study and uh, complete web or the Google spread? Oh, oh, so sorry. So uh, our purpose is to study the general graph. So the complete graph has been essentially has been already solved by this paper. So yeah, our goal is to study the general graph. Yeah. And well, uh, another, I see. And the Google's uh, supremacy used how 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 what's the random they choose? They just uh, fix every a point, every point and its neighboring direction, and then. Mm -hmm. There are only four directions, basically, if it's uh -huh. a language. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Okay. Oh, I think I think what this is just based on what I read in the paper, and I could be easily wrong. My impression is they are applying this kind of circuit, which choose the neighboring qubits in a horizontal way, and they are applying for each blue for each blue edge which connects two qubits, they apply a uh, they apply a random unitary transformation on these two qubits. So, and they apply several like uh, random unitary transformations on those neighboring qubits for one circuit. And after applying one circuit like this, they apply another circuit like this, which, which, trans, uh, which do the unitary transformation on neighboring qubits, but in the, vert, uh, but in the vertical way. And they do this kind of uh, they do this kind of uh, circuits many many times. So I, that that's what I understand from the Google's quantum supremacy circuit. Oh, I see. So their uh, randomness still uh, built on the unitary matrix. How, how yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, I see. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. They are they are still have randomness on the unitary matrix, but they won't really choose let's say the top left and the bottom right they want to choose this two this two qubits and apply the unitary transformation because they have a underlying graph structure so they, so they will only choose the qubits which are neighbor to each other i see okay thank you oh yeah sure thanks for the question okay so now let's move on to the technical part. So again, our goal is to study the convergence of such process. And as I mentioned, it depends on lots of parameters. So let's specify them. First of all, it depends on the initialization. So to formulate the problem, we will always normalize the initialization such that the initialization has the unit LP norm. And the actual P depends on the actual metric we, have to, we, we will choose. And then we define the metric for us to measure the distance of our random vector to the uniform vector. So we will adopt the usual definition of the mixing time. We will define the PQ mixing time, which use this sort of long notation, but, and it's defined in this way. But in English, basically it means, uh, it means the mixing time is a time T such that no matter what initialization you choose, as long as the initialization has unit LP norm, then after T steps, the LQ distance between your random vector with the uniform vector will be upper bounded by epsilon. So this is the definition for the mixing time. Basically, it controls the worst case LQ distance under the LP initialization. So uh, to make our life slightly easier, in this talk, we will only consider the case that P equals Q equals one or two. In fact, this covers the most interesting case, and we will mainly focus on P equals Q equals one because the L1 converge has some interesting probabilistic interpretation and is the usual sort of distance people studied, and it's in fact the mathematically most interesting case. So, 
uh, to get some intuitive understanding on how this distance actually evolves or decays, we made some numerical experiment here. So uh, I make this slightly larger. Basically, this is a numerical experiment we've done. So we consider there we consider the number of nodes equals ten to the power of eight, so one hundred million nodes. And we consider two kinds of graph. One is Kn, the complete graph. The other is the star graph, which uh, is basically you have one root and several other leaves. So for the complete graph, we it actually doesn't matter that much which which node we start. So here, the we start at vectors of the type one zero 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 because we want to normalize them. And for the complete graph, no matter which node we start, it doesn't make any difference because of the symmetry. But for star graph, where your start actually matters. So if you start with a one on the center and a zero elsewhere, it behaves quite differently with if you start with a one on a leaf and a zero elsewhere. So this is captured by the figure here. As you can see, the uh, black curve is the complete graph, and the blue and red curve are the star graphs with different initializations. But uh, overall pattern is when the time goes goes larger and larger, the the KN curve, the black curve, it seems it always have the smallest L1 distance, which in other words says the complete graph seems to always mix faster than the star graph, no matter where you start. So at the very beginning, as you can see, the star graph decays faster, but eventually it seems the complete graph decays faster. And this is actually an interesting phenomenon that we will be able to prove eventually in our main theorem. Okay. So after introducing the setup related to the stochastic process, we need also need some graph definition. So if we were given a graph and directed connected graph G, we will define the degree matrix DG, which is basically a diagonal matrix, and the, each diagonal entry corresponds to the number of degrees of the corresponding node. And we can define the adjacency matrix, which is a binary matrix. The IGS entry equals one if and only if there is a edge between i and j, and otherwise it's zero. So all the diagonal entries equals zero. And based on the degree and adjacency matrix, we define the Laplacian, which is degree minus adjacency. So it's standard, like uh, spectral graph theory tells us all the eigenvalues of the Laplacian are non-negative. And in fact, the smallest eigenvalue of the Laplacian will always be zero, because if you multiply this L matrix with a vector which takes one everywhere, then L times the one vector equals the zero vector. So it always have a zero eigenvalue. And the second smallest eigenvalue is something informative. So the first, the smallest eigenvalue is zero regardless which graph you choose. But the second smallest eigenvalue actually depends on the graph. And it tells us a lot of information of the graph geometry. So the second smallest eigenvalue, we call that lambda 2G, which will be crucial for the theoretical analysis. And we need some more definition. In fact, we need one more definition. We de for each graph G, we define gamma G to be the ratio between the number of edges over the second smallest eigenvalue. So this will be gamma of G. And in fact, when G is connected, the spectral graph theory tells us lambda 2 of G will always be strictly positive. So this quantity is always well defined. It won't be infinity as long as the graph is connected. So a few quick examples. If G is taken as the complete graph, then there are like n choose two nodes. So the number of, oh, sorry, there are n choose two edges. So number of edges is of order n square. And the lambda 2 of Kn is of order n, so gamma is of order n. For star graph, we have uh, n edges, and the lambda 2 is at the order of theta 1, so gamma is at the order of n. For cycle graph, again, there are n like edges, but lambda 2 is much smaller. Lambda 2, we can prove, is at the magnitude of 1 over n squared, 
So gamma is that the magnitude of n cubed. And there are many other examples, but we just use this to illustrate the concept of gamma. Okay, so after having this definitions, we go to the L2 convergence. In fact, we have the following theorem which characterize the mixing time for the L2 convergence. The inside quantity is the L2 mixing time, and we have a, o, a lower and upper bound. In fact, the upper bound is already known in Elder's survey paper, and the lower bound, we haven't found the reference, but since the proof is relatively simple, we believe it must be known to many people. But this result is very nice because if we look at the upper and the lower bound, we will find that this is actually a very sharp like upper lower bound. The upper bound is four gamma g times log one over epsilon, and the lower bound is two gamma g minus one times log one over epsilon. So basically when g has n nodes, this gamma g would be at the magnitude of n. So essentially, this gamma g already captures the correct magnitude of L2 convergence because the lower bound is of order gamma g and the upper bound is also at the order of upper gamma g. So as long as you don't care about the exact constant, gamma g already tells you the correct magnitude of L2 convergence. Essentially, for general graph, we can say the L2 convergence is, is totally controlled by gamma g. The upper and lower bound just uh, differs by a factor of two. And the proof is not complicated, but interesting. So for the upper bound, basically we can calculate this conditional expectation. This is the conditional expectation is we're calculating the square of uh, the magnitude square of the vector at a time t plus one, given the vector at a time t. Basically, we're calculating the one step ahead magnitude square. And once we do the calculation, we just do the calculation according to the process, we will find that there is some contraction on this square magnitude. And from the contraction, we can like uh, translate the contraction to the upper bound without too much difficulty. So the upper bound is a sort of natural. And the, to prove the lower bound, recall that when we are defining the mixing time, we define the mixing time under the worst case scenario. Therefore, our goal is to find a hard or a slow initialization. And for the L2 mixing, the way we find the slow initialization is we simply choose the initialization to be the normalized eigenvector of the Laplacian corresponds to the second smallest eigenvalue. And when we choose the initialization in this way and do the calculation, we will find the lower bound auto sort of automatically appears there. So that's why I say it's not really a complicated proof. And because of the time, I will probably not go into the detail of this proof because I want to save some time for the uh, L1 convergence and its lower bounds proof. But basically the L2 convergence is controlled by gamma G. That's the take home message. The L1 convergence is much more interesting. So uh, similar to the L2 case, we have this general result, which is true for every graph for the L1 convergence. And if you compare this with the L2 result, you will find the lower bound is exactly the same as the L2 case, but the upper bound is different. The upper bound diff is different from the L2 case by a factor of log n. So in the L2 case, gamma g already captures the correct magnitude of the mixing time. But for the L1 case, there exists a log n gap between the upper and lower bounds, which comes from this quantity. Okay, and our main question for this work is for a general graph G, how we can decide the actual mixing time, where is, where is the mixing time? We know it's between gamma G and gamma G log n, but we want to locate it sort of more precisely. That's the main question we have. So, so uh, what, what, oh, what sorry. do you mean? Uh, sorry, uh, what do you mean by general G here? When you say uh -huh. general graph, what do you mean by that? 
Oh, so by general graph, I mean, basically, uh, basically from this, basically this result is true for any graph G. So for yes. any connected graph G, this holds. Yes. But this inequality isn't sharp, isn't sharp in the sense that there is a log n gap between the upper and the lower bounds. Mm. And so we're not satisfied enough with this inequality because it's not sharp enough. So mm. we want to know, like, uh, are we, basically we're asking, are we able to improve this to get the correct magnitude for general graph or mm. at least uh, for some interesting or important class of graphs? That's so you are you are, you are not really want to discuss the effect of like inward out integral out degree of the graph or connectivity of the graph. You are, you are not really care about that. You are care about the general picture. About um, it. Oh yeah, so that's a great question. So the, but first of all, let me make a quick clarification because here we only consider undirected graph. So the, okay. there's there's no like an in degree or out degree because mm -hmm. the edge are not directed. Mm -hmm. And for the second question is uh, we do basically, we do want to understand the connectivity of the graph and its influence on the mixing time. Because mm -hmm. in general, basically this is the, most the general result that we can achieve, but this result isn't sharp. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we want to know if we have some additional structure of the graph, can we improve this result? Can we mm -hmm. bridge this log n gap? And the additional information depends on the connectivity or some other structures of the graph. So that's one thing we're looking at. And yeah. another thing we're looking at is we do want some result which holds for every connected graph because that's sort of universal and uh, mm. <laughs> we, saw, we, mm. we do want some other results besides this general bounds for mm. which holds for every graph. That's mm. another direction that we are pursuing. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, but well, thanks a lot for the question. Yeah. Okay, and before doing this, it's necessary to go back to the complete graph case because that's essentially the base case that we can analyze. And the main result in Chatterjee Diaconis Slide Jones and also probability paper is the L1 mixing time on the complete graph has a sharp cutoff at n log n over 2 log 2 plus a cutoff window of size n times square root of log n. It's a little complicated, but I will explain. Basically, their results tells us the, comp the, 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 decay, the decay of the L1 distance. We know the L1 distance will decay. Initially, it will be somewhere near 2, and eventually the distance between the vector with the uniform vector will be goes to 0. So the decay happens at time n log n over 2 log 2, and it sort of happens abruptly in the sense that if you are at a time n log n over 2 log 2 minus some lower term, lower term, so this n square root of log n is relatively lower term comparing with n log n. So if you are at this time, then if we calculate the L1 distance, it doesn't mix at all because the L1 distance will be close to 2. It will be very far away from 0. But if you are at n log n over 2 log 2, plus c n square root of log n. So if you are after this quantity and you are after by a factor of c n square root of log n, then the L1 distance will abruptly decays to zero. So if you draw a picture for the L1 distance decay, you will find the L1 distance decay sort of abruptly and the middle point is n log n over two log two. And the window is of size n square root of log n. That's what people call a cutoff because it's sort of, it's not decays smoothly, but it decays abruptly. And that's a very mysterious and interesting phenomenon which happens in many Markov chains and also doesn't happen in many Markov chains. So still for today, like studying the cutoff for Markov chains is sort of the very popular topic. And their paper basically shows very like accurate result. We know for the complete graph, the mixing time 
will be n log n over 2 log 2, and we know the exact magnitude, we even know the exact constant, we even know the cutoff window, so that's very sharp. But that's for the complete graph, and we want to know the general graph. So for the general graph, we have some results, and just as the question suggests, we have two types of results. The first result is the universal result, which holds for every graph. So we have a universal n log n over 2 log 2 lower bound for all graph in the L1 sense. So as long as the graph is connected, then you have the mixing time of order n log n over 2 log 2. So this bound is better by our previous bound here. Our previous bound here, essentially, the magnitude is gamma g. And the gamma g is, uh, in the worst case, gamma g is at the magnitude of n. So basically, this tells you uh, order n universal lower bound. But in fact, after careful analysis, we can argue we have a universal n log n over 2 log 2 over bound for every connected graph. And this result has two quick corollary. The first corollary is this lower bound essentially cannot be improved because this is the correct result for the complete graph as Percy et al. proves. This is exactly the correct result for the complete graph. So since this holds for every graph and there is one graph which attains this universal lower bound, so it means it cannot be really improved. So it's sharp. And also, it tells us the complete graph makes asymptotically fastest because it attains the universal lower bound. So basically, among all the connected graphs, the complete graph makes it asymptotically fastest in the L1 sense. So this is a relatively intuitive result because complete graph is the most connected graph, most connected than every other graph. So it's reasonable to conjecture it makes it fastest. But to actually prove this, as you will see, it requires quite some effort. And just like many other results in graph theory, like to argue it holds for every other graph, it requires some effort. So this is a universal type result. And again, if we have additional structure on the graph, we can do, we can improve the previous uh, general, general bound. We can get the correct magnitude of the mixing time. For example, we study some like a standard geometries. For example, for the cycle, we prove n cube is the correct magnitude for the mixing time. And for the star, we prove n log n is the correct magnitude for the mixing time. So when there are extra structure, then we can utilize those structure to get sharper results than the general upper and the lower bound. And in fact, I take this two example here because these two are interesting in the sense that this n cube is in fact predicted by the lower bound here. If we take G to be the cycle graph, then basically the lower bound gives the correct mixing time. And the n log n result for the star graph is actually predicted by the upper bound for this general result. If we take G to be the star graph, then you will see the upper bound gives you the n log n. So basically, this tells us when the, graph dif when the graphs are different, then sometimes this gives you the correct magnitude, sometimes this gives you the correct magnitude. And of course, another natural question is, can we sort of come up with some general result to get the correct magnitude, which is true for every graph, and that's some outstanding open question I will discuss at last, but we don't know how to solve it for now. So besides these two results, there are some auxiliary results, but that can be like a very useful for future research. For example, we show since we need to care about the slowest initialization because we care about the worst case scenario, we show the slowest initial vector is always at the corner. At the corner means the slowest initial vector is always attained at some vector of the type 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. So one coordinate equals one, the other equals zero. The slowest initialization always looks like this. So sort of it. It, it somehow simplifies many of our analysis a lot. 
And we have some other motivation, uh, observations which can be found in our paper. And because of the time, I will not really talking about how we prove the slowest initialization because like uh, I think the lower bound is more interesting, but the slowest initialization tells us the result is important. It tells us without a loss of generality, we can always assume the process starts at a vector of zero, 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 one, zero, zero, zero. So we can always assume the process starts at this kind of vectors. Okay, so then let's move on to the n log n lower bound. I can go through the proof. So um, to prove the lower bound, a very natural idea to prove such lower bound is to use entropy. So suppose V is a non-negative vector with unit L1 norm, then we can define its entropy as the summation of VI log, oh, in fact, there's a typo, it should be log one over VI, but uh, I should add a negative sign here, maybe. But basically, we can define the entropy in the usual way we define entropies, which is the summation of VI log one over VI. Then, basically, for the initialization, as I mentioned, it's a vector where one coordinate equals one, all the others equals zero. So if we calculate its entropy, the entropy equals zero. And in the end, when it becomes the uniform vector or when it's sufficiently close to the uniform vector, then the entropy of the uniform vector would be log n. So basically, the entropy will increase from zero to log n throughout the process. And in fact, we can, we can further bound the entropy change by the following lemma. The lemma says, if we are averaging vi and vj, then the entropy will increase by at most log two times vi plus vj. And the proof is like a one line proof. It's just a, a simple algebraic manipulation, but this give, gives us a way to upper bound the energy increase. So based on this, we already have a good idea or good heuristic towards proving the universal lower bound. So the heuristic is, in fact, when we are averaging, doing the average, we don't know which pair we will choose. So eventually we will average over all the possible pairs. So we will average among all the edges. So if on average, the entropy increase by like log two times two over n, so we, 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 we use this two over n because we are averaging two indices and the summation of n indices equals n. So the summation of two indices after averaging, we hope is approximately two over n. So if that is the case, an average after one step, on average, the entropy increased by at most this amount, then we know we need to increase the entropy from zero eventually to log n. And every step you increase by at most of this quantity. So intuitively it takes log n over this amount of steps at least. And if you calculate this, you will find this is n log n over two log two, which is precisely what we have for the complete graph and it's, what, it's exactly what we want to prove. So if, this, if this becomes equality or it can be, if this can be made rigorous in some sense, then we prove what we want. In fact, this kind of idea, this is already a heuristic idea to bound the entropy increase and use the entropy increase to bound the mixing time. This idea works reasonably well when the graph is relatively regular, which means every node have approximately the same number of edges. So that's a good thing for us. But what we want to do is we want to do for every graph. So we cannot make any such assumption like a relatively regular. We want this to work for every graph. And in fact, there are some very bad cases or very hard cases. For example, if we look at the star graph, the star graph is not regular at all because all the leaf has, no, has degree one, but the root has degree n. The, the, the root is connected with every other edge, but all the other edge only connects to the root. So if we, if we are working on the star graph, 
and we start with a one in the root and a zero elsewhere, then after one step, no matter which edge we choose, we know this one will be average with some zero. So eventually the vector will be lots of zeros and the two point fives. So the vector will become something like this. And if we calculate the entropy increase, we will find the entropy increase by log two. This is way too large because previously we hope that the entropy should uh, increase by some constant over n. We hope the entropy increased by order one over n. But for this specific hard graph, in, in this case, the entropy increased by log two, which tells us we cannot directly use the idea of entropy to uh, do a lower, to do a universal lower bound with order n log n, because this kind of, this type of graph exists, and we need to somehow compensate for this irregular graph. Sorry, okay. uh, Sorry. I have a naive question. Uh, 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 yes. si yeah. uh, since your purpose is to prove the lower bound, so yes. it means uh, the faster, the better. So if increase larger, then it's a good thing uh, because it can give you better uh, convergence. Why, why oh. is not okay? Oh, oh, so yeah, thanks for the question. So in fact, when we are proving the lower bound, uh, we want the sharper the better, which means, uh, for example, if we look at if we look at the general result, we, if we look at the general result, when g has n nodes, this quantity basically we already know this quantity will be of the order n. So from this general easy result, we already have an order n lower bound, but uh, our conjecture based on the, our studies, we think this order n lower bound is not sharp. In other sense, in other case, it's not the correct lower bound. We think maybe for all the graph, the correct universal lower bound should be n log n. That's our guess. And that means we need to have a tighter lower bound. So that's why, like, uh, if we have this, like, sorry, if we have this log two, uh, if we have the entropy increase log two, then the lower bound we can get would be like, for example, would be as a magnitude of log n. So that's too loose, although that's smaller than n or smaller than n log n, but that's not sharp enough for our purpose. So that's why we think this is not good for us. But if, like, if this is the case for upper bound, then sometimes we want the upper bound to be smaller because smaller upper bound means it makes faster. But we, are, we want to prove the sharp lower bound. So we actually, we actually don't want, we want to like uh, find some quantity which is not increasing too fast for every graph. I see, thank you. Um, sorry, another question is for this, uh -huh. uh, the, the uh, previous slide. Yeah. Um, when you say the entropy measure, the, your, your argument is basically based on the average. So yes, how, yeah. how can you infer this to the lower bound? Because it's the, in the average sense, the, the mm -hmm. step increase. So uh, do you need to another proof for this or it's a general argument? Oh, oh so th first of all, this is a heuristic argument and uh, we do need some other results. So basically, uh, but I can explain maybe in uh, very shortly. So basically, you are totally right that we need to consider the expectation sense. But basically, if we have this kind of result, assuming we have a nice graph that this holds, then what we can argue is after n log n, if we do like uh, steps less than n log n, then the expected entropy of our vector would be far away from the entropy of the uniform vector. And the expected entropy far away from the uniform vector's entropy will further imply the expected L1 distance will be far away, would be great, or would be much larger than epsilon. So it means it doesn't uh, mix. So we, we do need some like intermediate step and some auxiliary like inequalities to bridge the averaging of entropy with the L1 convergence. But uh, yeah, that's, that, that's we, we do need some of these inequalities. Yeah. Okay, thank you. 
Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, so because of the time, I need to go slightly faster. And the next slide is the, like, uh, I guess maybe the most important idea. Basically, we discuss directly using the entropy won't give us the sharpest bound as we expected. So we want to sort of modify the entropy function. So we define something called augmented entropy function as this. As you can see, the first term is just the entropy. And the second term is a linear combination. So basically, it's a linear or weighted summation of vi. And this weights, we call that beta i. The sequence are non-negative, and these are actually parameters that will be chosen depending on the graph. So for different graphs, we will be able to choose different uh, parameters. And the proof agenda is we will show for each specific graph we will be able to choose the graph specific parameter beta i greater than or equal to zero, such that the initialization has f value equals zero. And at each step, the increase of f would be no more than order of one over n. However, the average vector will have f value. The f value of the average vector will be greater than the entropy because this term will always be non-negative. And therefore, the f value of the average vector will be greater than or equal to log n. But each step, it only increased by at most one over n. So we have an on n log n lower bound. That's like the proof agenda. Yeah. And the first remark we have for the f function is the f function, there are slight differences between the f and the entropy function. So f will not always increase with t. It's not like entropy. Entropy will always increase, but the f function will always be non-negative, will be always be greater than or equal to the entropy, but it may not always increase. But since we want a lower bound, so this is not uh, like a bad fact, in fact. And the second remark is for the star, in fact, eventually we design the f function to be the entropy plus twice of the center. So as you can see, when you are averaging the center with the leaf, the entropy will decrease, but the second, uh, uh, sorry, the entropy will increase, but the second term will decrease. So they will in total compensate for the increase of F. So this is, but this is just an idea and we have a key lemma. Basically the lemma says, we have a graph and we define its degree vector, which is the collection of the degrees of each node. And we define d bar as the average degree. Suppose we have, suppose for this vector, oh, sorry, suppose for this graph G, we can find a vector beta such that there exists some constant which satisfies this inequality. Then we can show this G has immediately an n log n lower bound for its mixing time. So I need to be a little careful on this inequality. Basically, uh, beta, is the, beta and the c are the vector and the constant we want to choose depending on g. And d is the degree vector. And the less than or equal to should be read as element-wisely less than or equal to because both left and right hand side are vectors. So I'm actually saying every element of D is less than every element of the right hand side vector. But as long as this inequality is satisfied, then the lemma says we have an n log n lower bound. So uh, the main lemma, after we have all this intuition, proof of the main lemma is already becomes much easier. So again, the idea is we estimate the increase of the f value. So the f uh, consists of an entropy term and a linear term. The linear term can be directly calculating out with uh, equality. We don't even need to bound this uh, linear term. And the entropy term, we can bound the en uh, entropy increase by our previous lemma on the entropy decrease, oh, sorry, on the entropy increase. So that will give us the first inequality. And based on the assumption of the lemma, which says there exists a beta and a C, it will give us the second inequality. And the second inequality will eventually, if we sort of 
uh, rearranging terms and do the calculation, we will have this result. Basically, it's because when we're calculating one transpose times V, we know the V is a unit vector of like uh, non-negative entries. So one transpose times V equals one. So this term got canceled out. And the two canceled out with two. D bar is the average degree. And the E is the total number of edges. So their average will be two over N. That's how we get this uh, estimate on the on, on, on the averaging like uh, increase of the F value. And after we establish this, as I mentioned previously, we need to connect this entropy or this augmented entropy with the distance of L1. So along the way, we need some auxiliary lemmas, which I will skip for now. But if you believe me, basically, I will basically this says if we don't run the process long enough, long enough means at the order of n log n steps, then their entropy will be far away from the entropy of the uniform vector. And that further tells us the L1 distance will be far away from epsilon. So it doesn't mix at all. So after establishing the lemma, all we remain is to argue for every G, we can find such beta and such C. But in fact, that already boils down to a very simple linear algebra problem. Basically, that we have another lemma. We say for any gra connected graph G, this equation, the D bar is just as we, well, as we like uh, defined before, this equation always has a solution which is orthogonal to the one vector. And this is purely linear algebra. This equality, uh, this lemma holds because the right-hand side, if you calculate the right-hand side, if you do the inner product with the one vector, you will find the inner product is always zero. So the right-hand side belongs to the space which are orthogonal to the one vector. And the left-hand side, if we allow x to exhaust all the possibilities in Rn, then the left-hand side uh, consists of all the vectors in the space which are orthogonal to zero. Therefore, we will be able to find one x such that this equality holds for every small c. And we can pick small c as q log 2. It holds for every c, so we can pick a specific c. And this equality holds for c equals 2 log 2 will in turn tells us the inequality we want for the main lemma holds for c equals log 2. And the c equals log 2 gives us the n log n over 2 log 2 lower bound. So that's essentially, that's essentially the proof. So all the others are more or less like uh, technical details. And I think, the, I think the idea is first to use the entropy, but then realize the entropy doesn't work for every graph. So we sort of try to use some trick or design some other like a maybe more clever entropy function, which is here we do the augmented entropy. And luckily the augmented entropy works perfectly well for our purpose. So um, that's basically the result. Sorry, I go over a little bit, and there are lots of potential generalizations. For example, we conjecture this is actually the correct magnitude for every graph G, but we don't know if the conjecture is true or false. We cannot solve this. And we, are, we don't know if other graphs have the cutoff phenomenon as well, similar to the complete one. And also, this is, again, this is just the one instance of the LLU process. So it's reasonable to consider other dynamics and on graphs to see if the same idea or similar idea can be used to give interesting, like a non-trivial results for upper and lower bounds. And lastly is we're working on a specific graph G. So it's also reasonable to consider random graph or even graphons, which are sort of a way of generating random graphs. So that's some like directions that I can think of for the generalization. Yeah, but thank you so much. And I think that's all for my talk. It can be found in the archive. And also you can just scan the QR code <laughs> to locate our manuscript. Yeah, thanks again for the invitation. I'm happy to take any questions. OK, thank, thank you, Professor uh, Guanyang Wang, for this very nice introduction, very nice talk. Thanks. Uh, 
So uh, is there any question or comments from the audience? Uh, so uh, I, I may have uh, two questions. Yes. Uh, the first is uh, um, in, in your motivation, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you, you mentioned there are like a uh, transition and swap uh, everything to in uh, to nodes or the matrix operating and uh, inventory mm -hmm. or matrix rotation. Yes, yes. So there will be different transitions methods. So yes. in your proof, does the transition method, a different transition method will uh, different for, for this uh, result? Does it yeah, that's, yeah, that's a great question. That's actually something I, I'm thinking of studying now. <laughs> I actually don't know. I don't know the answer. So I think that the, the average, the, the, basically the feature of averaging Will definitely influence the process. Like, uh, like uh, averaging and swapping are very different. Averaging is also very different from like applying the unitary transformation. Those all can be very, very different processes. But um, so, so the I would imagine the actual like a quantitative result of those can be quite different. But the I think the techniques, especially the entropy techniques, I, I, I'm now thinking if that can be generalized to other settings, especially like the unitary transformation. Yeah, I, I think th those techniques may be generalizable. Okay, so uh, I just want to make sure, so your technique basically uh, apply for the averaging case or which case? Oh, so here we are specifically working on the averaging case, so the the technique so, so the like augmented entropy technique works for the averaging case, and though I'm sort of thinking of gen to I'm thinking the possibility of generalizing this technique to 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 do maybe lower bounds for other cases, but uh, I haven't uh, really tried them out yet. Yeah, I hope that can be useful because yeah, that seems like a that seems to be useful <laughs> to me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay, thank you very much. And my another Thanks. question is uh, can you comment on uh, Google's result? Do, do you think there is some uh, better way to go around their uh, pharmacy from the graph point of view? Uh, so, yeah, something like this. Oh, I, I, I think that's a question that I, I, I want to ask you guys. <laughs> I, I'm very, I'm like a baby student of quantum computing, so I honestly like are just reading the papers and just now I'm just at the stage of trying to understand what they are doing. So I, I'm afraid I'm not able to really comment on whether they're doing the good thing or there are better ways. But yeah, I hope one day I can comment. <laughs> but I, I'm actually curious about your thoughts on this or other like a supremacy experiments. Yeah. yeah, as far as I know, Sorry. there is some tensor network, a tensor a uh, structure that can be used to go around this. So mm -hmm. your your uh, method can be combined with some tensor method. Or... Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks, thanks. That's very good to know. Yeah, I, 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 thanks a lot. I will definitely look them up after after the talk. Yeah, but thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Yeah, I'm so indeed. Uh, uh, there is a, a classical algorithm that actually can kind of like did the similar kind of the estimation of the outcome from this random circuit. And mm -hmm. this algorithm was, pro was proved by a Chinese professor, I think in Beijing uh, mm -hmm. this year. So wow. in fact that Google supremacy experiment does, uh, is no longer, does not no longer hold. I yeah. see, I see. Yeah, yeah. So, but we I still see. have like this Poisson sampling uh, supremacy experiment. So, I think for that, they are even a, a efficient classical algorithm yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would okay. also be very interested in the results. Yes. You do. Yeah. So, I always appreciate it if you can also send that to me. I can like uh, study a bit more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 So sure. Um, and yeah, I also follow uh, I I would like to ask Yan Qi to follow this up because uh, one of uh, Yan Qi has been reading um, this convergence of this semi group 
Um, mm -hmm. And it, it basically studies similar problems as yours. Um, uh -huh. So maybe, uh, Yanqi, you could organize uh, meetings and probably go over those results you have surveyed and, and introduce it to, to Professor Wang to see whether he is interested. Okay, so oh, oh, that's that's okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, I'll be yeah I'll be very happy to like uh, start with uh, start another like a like a count, uh, sorry a, another meeting to discuss like and also yes. for me to learn a bit more on this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We 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 could could uh, study uh, together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, any other questions? Okay. Um, yeah. So if not, uh, thank you very much. So yeah, uh, it's, it's really uh, a, a very interesting result. And thanks could, a lot. Uh, yeah, we could we'll talk more later. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thanks. For okay. The